Uh, but we're really excited that uh, Gavin invited us to talk to you guys. So um, I'm uh, Chris Heine. So I work at uh, Oklahoma State University and I'm the equine extension specialist there. And I'm currently the chair of our extension horses, which is part of the extension. Um, and then Colleen Brady at Purdue University uh, is also equine extension specialist. And then Kathy Anderson um, from the University of Nebraska. Um, so Gavin uh, chatted with us about uh, our experiences um, with a community of practice through e-extension and how um, maybe you guys can learn from some of the shared experiences that we've had. So we're actually going to be presenting this as kind of a team effort. <laughs> so, so Kathy and Colleen um, will kind of get us started with a lot of the historical perspective and some of the length and breadth of this particular community of practice with the extension and then I'll take over later um, with a little bit of what we're up to um, currently. So and I will be the official clicker as we go through <laughs> since I control the the screen so we'll get started. Okay sorry I'm trying to clean things out so I put thingy. Um, Okay, so this is Kathy and I got I get to start off with a few of the things as far as where we've come from. And so a little bit, I think what Chris alluded to is um, our group really is primarily made up of extension specialists across the US. Um, at times, I'd say we probably have had 50 or more members. <laughs> it would be nice that we said that they were all as engaged, um, but we probably have <laughs> that number of 15 to 20 that are pretty highly engaged probably really um, are is pretty realistic because when we have our meeting that's kind of what we get and so those are the folks that really do um, are very active um, you know participate do a lot of different kinds of things um, our group really started um, back in 2007 2008 um, with the inception of um, e extension the um, I forget the name of the group. It was, was it Horse Quest? No, it wasn't Horse Quest. It, it was, it, something started down there with the southern section in an area and then it, it blossomed into e-extension. And we were fortunate that some of the main developers of e-extension in, its, in, its, in the broad sense um, were um, some of our horse specialists. And so they pulled all of us together to really kind of um, get things working, get things rolling on the horse side of it. And so it really um, has been a very good thing for many of us because so many of us in the horse area, and we'll talk a little bit about this more as we move through, are um, kind of sole entities. And so it's been a way for us to get a bigger collaboration um, of folks in the similar area, but across the country. Because in contrast, like here in Nebraska, I can't keep a number on how many beef people we have, and I'm the sole horse person. So to have a group of folks that we can work together with and with um, the technology that we have which has really grown and been simplified over the, the time that we've had this um, it's it's really been able to um, you know work together quite well so next slide please okay so Sarah I think we'll probably address your question here um, in terms of what disciplines do we focus on I mean we're very focused on on equine and in the horse area um, but in regards to the people on the team, we have people that are focused in nutrition, we have people that are focused in um, reproduction, uh, we have people that are focused in exercise physiology. Um, so we actually have representatives of all of the major um, kind of research focused areas or management areas. And then we can also draw in, and we've had a lot of success drawing in people for specific issues. So we'll talk a little bit later about some grants. And so as a group, we reached out very specifically for some of the, like we were doing when EHV1 was um, the equine coronavirus of the year. Um, we were able to reach out to people at other institutions that aren't necessarily members of our group, but we're in that area. And then, um, and especially because I think of this um, diversity, the way we deliver information, they could access multiple states, although the information could go nationally. It was appealing for some of those people to actually participate, even if it was just on a, for one very particular curriculum piece. 
Uh, we do a lot of, we use actually a lot of social media um, to draw people to our site and to our information, which is actually one thing that Gavin mentioned about some of the strategies you all use with social media that I think we're really interested in hearing in hearing your strategies and, and see if we could do some of those things uh, better. Because at the heart of us, our group, we're all a bunch of horse extension specialists with degrees in animal sciences. And a lot of this other stuff, we're kind of, you know, figuring out as, as we go along. But we've had really good luck um, with, especially Facebook and YouTube as being really good ways to attract clientele, to interact regularly and engage with clientels. And we use a combination of scheduled posts um, and then things that are in reaction or in response to something really specific. Um, one thing we do every year, which again, which will come up several times, is we have an annual face-to-face -face meeting. Well, it just so happened one year we were having our face-to-face -face meeting at the same time that some new federal legislation came down about licensing, um, commercial driver's licensing and how that was gonna affect the horse industry. And so, since we were all together, one of our people with expertise in that area put together an infographic, we put it on Facebook and ended up with over a reach of over a million people on that one um, on that one post. And that was definitely one that would have been in that reactionary category for information on something that was um, an issue at the moment. Um, and then we use the YouTube site. Um, it has, right now we have almost 15,000 uh, subscribers on our YouTube site. Um, we have, I mean, if you're interested in the data, we can look it up and share, you know, how many views and how many hours of, of views there are. But we're pretty satisfied um, that we're meeting the needs of a lot of clientele uh, with our YouTube videos that we, that we post there. And then even if we incorporate the videos into some of our other coursework and things like that, we can again drive them back to that YouTube site and um, they can see uh, other things that we have to offer. So did that answer your question, Sarah, about the disciplines that we're involved in? Sorry, I'll just unmute, it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess like in Australia, we've got thoroughbred racing, we've got polo, oh. we've got pony club, oh, we've got okay. cutting, that kind of we've got like, okay, yeah, like what sort of, yeah, who, who are you working with? Like, um, I guess. So we have several people that are really involved with the stock horses. So like Kathy's um, a licensed judge for the American Quarter Horse Association, mm -hmm. several people that are judges in different areas there. Uh, we have a handful of yep. people that are involved in eventing, a um, couple of people that are involved with racing. Um, yeah, great. So you really do horses. bring it together. Yeah, I don't know that we really have anybody that does polo, but polo is not a big, Yeah, it's not a, it's not a real big sport mm -hmm. here. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, so we have people from, I mean, I, I think it would be similar to our general population, which has a heavy Western discipline flavor, mm -hmm. um, is our general yeah. population of the horse industry in the U.S., and I yep. think that would be reflective, reflected in our group. Um, yep. But we do have individuals that are um, engaged in other aspects, mm. in aspects of the horse industry. And it's just interesting because you've got, yeah, all of those, while the common theme is the horse, but obviously there's mm -hmm. Lots of so yeah, just applying that to what we do, you know, might be talking about young farmers, but they're interested in different areas or aspects mm -hmm. of their business. So it's how do you sort of yeah make sure your content is relevant to those different well sections. right, and they so, connect to it because we have yeah. found that some of our stuffs doing something as simple as changing a picture and right. taking out a picture mm. of the resource and putting in a picture of a rodeo horse. Now all of a sudden the people in that discipline really feel more connected to it. Like mm. this is about us too. It's us. So we do try to be fairly conscious, especially with some of our infographics and things like that, to not have it obviously be this breed or that breed or a certain discipline. And you'll see an example later. And even even this one, I mean it's a Western horse, but you have it's a Western setup, but you have no idea what type of horse that is under there. Mm. Um, when you look at this picture there, it could be um it could be an Arabian. It could be a saddlebred. It, mm. And so we we do try to be somewhat conscious with that. But but about eight, you know quarter horses are by far the most popular breed in the country. Mm. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cheers.
So kind of just kind of carrying on with that a little bit, you know, we have a lot of different kinds of stuff that we um, do and all and kind of try to cover and present content, content in a variety of different ways that kind of a variety of different of our clientele can use because um, not every not one thing fits everybody and so we try to think of different ways and that's why this collaborative group works so well because we've all got different talents in different areas and just as you brought out you know different disciplines or different breeds of horses that that we're focused on and um, so we also try to go the gamut from you know youth to older we do know you know that our biggest audience is that middle-aged um, female, um, but we don't, you know, just straight market to them. And so as we go through some stuff, you'll see some things. I mean, we have a website um, that is constantly evolving. We've kind of had developed a new one. Now we're, that's still in, in and, and the current one that we're going to be using is going to be a little bit different um, that we're moving back to. Um, We've developed a variety and numerous learning lessons over the years. Some of those have been driven by some grants that we had at the time. Um, also just different things that um, probably a lot of them I think early on have been driven by, by grants or, or now it's kind of things that we know or have found that are of an interest in the industry, some issues, some disease types of things and different things like that. And so to complement those, you know, we do have, she mentioned the YouTube library and um, that was kind of an early on project of, of trying to populate ourselves. And we've got, I, she kind of quoted how many videos we have. It is a very popular um, portion and some people will just search and find those. We've integrated a lot of this stuff together. Same thing with the infographics and we'll show you another one. Um, the podcasts are something that's relatively new that we started this year. And like Chris has kind of been the champion of that. So we have different people that kind of focus on different kinds of areas. We've got one group that's focusing on the infographics, um, another on the learning lessons and the websites and those types of things. The podcast is something that's pretty cool. It's kind of a thing that's out there that's grown in popularity. And so Chris has us where she's, we've got kind of a, a, um, a template now that, that she, that we use and that she gets us on and to make it just another way of delivering stuff. And so everything is kind of much, pretty much you know, accessible out there. And the other nice thing with this is like on some things, if, oh, that's changed, that's updated, we can just go in and update some stuff and change it um, you know, and go on instead of things looking dated, especially you know, once we realize that some things need to be adjusted or updated and, and that type of thing. So. So these are some of the grant products we had mentioned and we didn't want to go through all as time has shifted and changed there. There used to be when eExtension was first established, there was actually some internal grant um, opportunities uh, to support the development of communities of practice um, as time has gone on. And, and I think that's one thing that comes from being a more mature community of practice that those types of funds they're more interested in using to help other people get started. So we've had to, figure out ways to become a little bit more financially um, self-sufficient. And at least in this country, we find it fairly challenging uh, to get grant funds for equestrian programming. Um, other areas, like if you wanted to do in the United States, if you wanted to do poultry welfare, you know, you can find funding all over the place. Um, but because um, the horse industry is so, um, not just that it's diverse, but it's very diffuse. So um, unless you're in a place like Kentucky or someplace that has a uh, understanding of the, a true understanding of the economic value of something like the thoroughbred racing industry, um, it can be a little bit challenging. Um, but we've had some decent success over the years getting grants um, from a variety of, of, and generally what they've done is gone and developed these learning lessons, which is kind of what we call come up some of our short courses and the one that's highlighted there is one we actually did a couple with the U.S. Equestrian Trust um, and that's the series that I mentioned before that we actually found out and we, we identified topics that were relevant to the horse industry at that time related to horse health and care and management and then had experts come in and they did webinars and we developed an online lesson um, and then made that available uh, to uh, to the horse industry broadly and um and that's and that's generally speaking what most of the grant funds 
think the only exception would be the one, uh, the institutional grant at the bottom that was for the body condition scoring, which is, uh, which is here. And um, all of the rest were, uh, uh, ended up in development of some type of an online um, modular set of lessons. Yeah, so our, we do have one app out there, one mobile app out there, um, and it is on our body condition score. Um, so this was brought together through some internal funds and stuff. And so we made it a collaborative effort between here at Nebraska and Purdue. And um, so it's just one example. Um, that's the only one that we have, you know, some things have kind of funneled away from apps, but it is one that is another product that we have. I'll tell you, we originally were charging a small amount for it and it wasn't, you know, worth, we weren't going to get a ton of money off of it. So now it's a free app. And um, so it's just another example of another um, means that we've explored um, to get, you know, a, another service, another, um, you know, type of thing out there for folks to use. And we've definitely tried some things that we stuck with and tried some things like apps that we said, you know, that was a lot of work and a lot of money and <laughs> the demand wasn't what we thought it was going to be. Right. We still have it, but it, yeah, it, it was so hard and so expensive to put together that there's other things that we can do more internal that can be more effective and better use of our time and our efforts. Okay. All right. I'm going to take over a little bit um, and talk about how we function and exist um, as what we at least like to believe as a successful community of practice. So we do have a, a leadership team that's fairly important that there are a group, um, a smaller subgroup that meets um, regularly before our monthly meetings, or by, or, and I'll talk about those meetings in a minute. Um, but we have essentially, it's a, almost a six year rotation between two year service as a vice chair, um, then transitioning to the chair position, and then as the post chair. So you do, um, that's an elected position by the group, uh, and so that provides at least a, a point person all the time, and you're allowed some maturation into that leadership position and then give some advice to the, to the current chair after you're done. Um, also, for reasons of continuity, um, two of the members, which are chatting with you right now, Kathy and Colleen, are sort of always on that leadership team. Uh, part of that is actually pretty doggone practical because we are handling money, um, whether it is grant funds or YouTube account with monetization or some of these other projects we'll talk about later. Um, and rather um, from bouncing from university to university where that fund source is, um, Nebraska has been the easiest one to work with. Um, and so Kathy is essentially the financial officer and, and um, controls that aspect. And so that isn't really a rotation because just realistically that wouldn't work. Um, we also appoint people into working group chairs. So we try to essentially um, subdivide our active projects. And so I think that's a unique part of our community of practice is that it is, uh, our goal is that we produce things. So we're not just people that share information, but we're producing product. Um, and so we need to always have somebody as a point person. And so they will provide reports um, when we do our monthly calls, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, and again, it provides some accountability. So it's not just the chair hounding everybody, but the um, chairperson of that working group can also then say, hey, uh, we're, I'm managing this team project and I need results. Um, so I am essentially officially the slave driver of the group, <laughs> so I will go to all of the chairs and say, what do you got? Um, but I think that's pretty important because everybody is busy with your own university job. Um, and so to make sure that we are moving forward, I think you do have to have somebody that says, okay, I need this by then um, to keep the, the group active and moving forward. So. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit of, you know, some nuts and bolts about how we approach doing this. And a lot of it sounds familiar uh, from what Gavin has shared with us and how um, your COPs in Australia are working. Uh, but I would say, you know, one of the key features through all of this is that we're building relationships and connections with each other. Now, I, you know, I do say with us and Extension Horses, 
this is also sort of a hobby recreation passion. So for us, we're also highly interested and engaged in the horse industry. And so it's easier for us to, to chat about different things because you know, we're horse people and so we have that connection. Uh, but I think they're definitely strengthened through our, our conference meetings. So we do video, uh, well, essentially Zoom chat right now, um, conferences every month. So the leadership team meets beforehand to um, talk about any issues that are coming out, current projects, if we need to have anything in the agenda, and try to make sure there's a formulated plan for the next meeting. Um, we do host all of our documents. They're available for the group. So while I will send out agendas and minutes, they're also available at any time if somebody wants to actually go look at them ahead of time, but I will send them out in the monthly reminder. And then in those um, monthly meetings, we do essentially committee reports. So the infographic committee, the podcast committee, um, the social media committee. So we get reports from each of those subgroups that then again provides that accountability to the group because we were asking what have you done, um, as well as a way to share information and ideas. The other thing that we use those calls for, which I find um, to be fairly important because, you know, like Australia, the U.S. is a pretty big country. So we may have different things happening regionally. Um, and so if Florida is saying, hey, you know, we've got some EHV outbreaks or whatever, what are you producing? We can share information. Um, we can talk about uh, things that maybe we're all seeing and that has spurred on ideas. Um, this isn't a product yet, but off of uh, a few of our calls, uh, you know, I had mentioned, hey, I keep getting these donkey calls and I'm not a donkey specialist. So then we started talking about donkeys. And so that is something that's in the thought process, development process is to, to produce some online curriculum for donkey owners, just because we had that shared experience. And, oh yeah, we're all getting kind of some calls about that. Um, we also think it's fairly important that we do have that annual face-to-face -face meeting. So we meet in Kentucky once a year, um, kind of on the off season. So after all of our annual reports are done, we're taking a breather in January, um, we have that meeting. Um, so that really does help develop those relationships and connections. So um, we have fun while we are working. So it's, a, it's definitely a, a working meeting. Um, but we do a lot of planning, you know, what are we gonna work on for the next year? We try to actually produce some content um, through that meeting. So it's three um, pretty focused days. Uh, we also typically have done something relative to professional development, uh, which provides a reason for people to come to the meeting and not just say, oh, we're going to continue to work, but you're going to learn something um, and essentially expand your professional portfolio a little bit by attending that meeting. So that's, I think, a pretty key part of that. Um, and because of those relationships and connections we build, um, we're able to work, I think, fairly well uh, in shared projects, even grant writing, um, course development, et cetera, because we've already built that uh, ability to relate to one another. We've built that accountability in, um, because again, we know each other and there's that sort of, you, this needs to be delivered by then. Um, and on just of a nuts and bolts, uh, we do file sharing so that we have a big repository of information that people can go uh, grab if they need something uh, to help with their own um, courses or own programs, uh, as well as then just actively working within a document. So that's uh, worked out fairly well for us. And in these days, there's so much of that going on. I don't, I don't think that's as novel anymore as it used to be, but we probably were a little ahead of the curve um, at the time. Um, so how do we keep it going? How to be successful? Uh, you definitely in a group like this, um, I think Colleen had mentioned, or maybe Kathy, at one time there were more than 50 people that were identified as members or contributors, but that was also, you know, in a time where there was more the ask the expert, ask the expert and you just had to respond to questions uh, versus now um, it has to be a little bit more active and, and working on the sign line curriculum. So our group is probably smaller, although we still have people that will uh, tune in once in a while and provide some feedback. Um, but it's important, you know, for us 
as a member of this group to kind of have an expectation, well, we do need you to contribute. Um, so we're not going to ask the world from you, but some sort of product or, you know, effort uh, sort of is expected. Um, I think that it's also important to reach out to new extension professionals, uh, be they uh, specialists at the university or even our county educators to make those personal connections and invite people to join the group because they may feel a little intimidated um, unless you do that. So that's one suggestion I think I would probably make. Um, so using your knowledge of people that have shared interest or that, that piece of your um, professional portfolio to be involved with that. So reaching out to people. Um, I think it's also important to let people play to their strengths. So uh, Kathy and Colleen mentioned we do a number of different activities. Um, and over the years, so the infographics are a great example. So we did a professional development meeting on, uh, or a session on doing infographics. Well, it turns out I hate them. I would rather stab myself in the eye than do an infographic because I find them terribly piddly and they just won't do what I want. Um, however, I've found that I have a bit of a flair for the podcasting. So <laughs> since I'm one of the more theatrical members of the group, that's sort of been my niche and my role. And so that's something that I take on. So I'm sort of the on-air presence uh, of the group. But that really does allow people to find their strengths. Again, Colleen's really good at online course development and can get all the gadgets and widgets to work. So it's sort of letting people find their place. You know, if you're really good at uh, writing journal articles, then that's your place versus if you uh, have more strength in this sphere or another. So uh, that has been important to let people kind of experiment a little bit. Um, and I think the other thing that's fairly important to the group too, because we all have main jobs, is that it's shared responsibility. So it's not one person or two people that have to develop an entire thing, but just pieces of it. So we'll talk about one um, coming up here a little bit while we're doing some of these short courses and make it not overwhelming for people to participate and also then invite them into the group and show them how this can benefit them uh, professionally. Um, so again, we want to make sure that people are fairly uh, engaged. So Kathy had already mentioned there's not always a lot of us, uh, our faculty type, so to speak, um, at our home institution. So there's not very many universities in the U.S. that have a robust equine department where there's a lot of you. So many of us are working um, in small numbers. And so if we only talk to our colleagues at the university. We never get to talk to horse people. So this actually is a great way for us to reach out um, and talk to those like ourselves. Uh, so that's been really refreshing because otherwise, you know, I talk to my beef people, but they don't always get what the horse people are like. Um, and, if, and if I can pop in here quick, Chris, because this yeah. kind of gets at one of the questions that somebody's been asking or what some people have been asking in the chat about how long people stay in the COP and things like that. And I think that's a big part of why people really, once they engage, they tend to stay engaged because we very well might be the only other, they may not have anybody at their home institution mm -hmm. that they can really collaborate with in this equine space. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty big deal for a lot of us. Yeah. So and and again, one that's the only one. it's making a point to reach out to people as well. Um, so I think that we've definitely in one of our newest projects have intentionally tried to bring in new people um, to let them see the benefit of what we're doing. Um, also on the, the grant side of things, because there's not a lot of equine grants out there, um, we play a lot more in like the educational field. Um, and for us, you know, anytime, you know, you have a multi-state or multi-institution collaboration that's going to be looked at a little bit more favorably in the grant process. And so, again, building those trust um, relationships and the ability to work together prior uh, makes that process a little bit smoother um, going forward. Um, so how do we convince people to play along? <laughs> so that's probably part of it. We could all say, hey, we're really fun and it's a great group of horse people and build these relationships. Uh, but we try to actively make sure people recognize the benefit. 
So our group has been pretty aggressive in pursuing professional recognition for one another. And so that is often, uh, it's part of the focus of our annual meetings is to say, what do we need to do to help people um, receive awards or help with promotion? Um, to make sure that we mentor uh, each other. And again, really, there's a, a bigger piece to this than just producing product, but really trying to help each other grow professionally um, and making sure people see the value in that. So that's, I think, tremendously important. Um, so we also try to communicate to the team really well. So all of those agendas and minutes get sent out to the greater group. So even what, you know, the lurkers are the ones that only join uh, now and again, they can see what we're doing and hopefully build excitement to say, wow, this is a group that's really pretty innovative and they're working with some important people and I might want to be part of that too. So I think that's also important to show, yeah, this is a pretty active group and might be like, the cool kid clubs. <laughs> and I'll just add a little thing in here, kind of goes with other stuff. Like for us, our probably our main national meeting where um, equine um, research, teaching that kind of stuff is presented is what we call Equine Science Society. And we try to make a point to always have something presented there related to our extension horses stuff. Um, so I think that we try to present stuff from this group on the national level kind of helps with um, some of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. We want people to recognize that we're um, doing pretty well. So on the, the funding model, and I think, well, I have a slide kind of on the challenges and um, kind of want to get to some of the fun things we're doing, but we also have tried to be fairly entrepreneurial in some of our approaches to funding. So I don't have a picture of it. We probably do need a, a, a graphic on that, but one of our more recent um, forays has been into online instruction for youth contests. So it's called the Hippology Academy. So this is something um, Colleen and Kathy actually are pretty instrumental in putting together, but they're essentially six week uh, modules to uh, give kids information to help them prepare for Hippology. So the equine contests that um, they ID things and they take tests and all kinds of fun material. Um, so some of the new software allows us to build really interactive lessons where the kids can take tests and quizzes and things like that to help prepare them. And so that has been um, pretty successful uh, and also allows that collaboration because a six week course is not something that's terribly easy for somebody to put together, but we can approach our colleagues and say, hey, can you do one week? we just need one week on this subject and so people are a lot more willing to say yeah i mean all of us can put together one week worth of material it's if you ask me to do 16 weeks that i might beg off um, and so that's been a great way to get new people involved and show the impact of what they're doing um, and it's been pretty successful um, the other thing as a group that we try to do again is really always have that professional development piece um, so we've engaged with that uh, through eExtension itself. So taking advantage of some of the uh, professional development workshops they've done. Um, so we've done a concept mapping workshop and uh, actually Craig and Ashley from eExtension uh, put on a, a mini impact collaborative for us. Um, that for us, you know, because we know each other, uh, I think actually makes the professional development piece a little bit easier because we can grumble and complain and look over at somebody else's work. <laughs> so it's sort of a shared experience as you're learning to do professional development versus just going to another meeting where you learn something. Um, and that again allows you to see where people sort of that's their skill set and they um, take it and run. Um, and so we really, uh, I think this group has been really helpful. I've learned a lot with video editing and audio editing um, and playing with instructional software that I never ever would have attempted to do if I was just in my own little silo here. Um, so that's been really fun. And then we can just reach out and say, hey, do you guys have this or uh, help me out? So that's been uh, pretty impactful. And so if we can go back a second to another thing I want to talk back. Can we go backwards? Yes, I can. It's the co-branding. As we talk about how things are valued and how everybody can feel like participating is we we have some kind of guidelines for co-branding so like this particular infographic was developed by people from the from Purdue University and the University of Minnesota 
as well as part of Extension Horses. So it's co-branded. So when um, people are turning in promotion packages and things like that, they can include this information and their um, administration can see that their institution is also branded on this and their institution is also getting um, some credit in the eye of the user uh, for being part of it. It's not this other entity that's somehow pulling visibility away from University of Minnesota or Purdue University or wherever people might be working. Yep, I think that's fairly important that we're not trying to steal credit from who pays our salary. <laughs> so. And that was a really big deal at the beginning when we started mm -hmm. this whole initiative is, is major concerns from people about if, if um, how am I gonna get credit back at my home institution for what I'm doing as part of this collaborative team. Mm -hmm. So we don't wanna be sunshine and roses. Um, there's also some challenges that we face. Uh, certainly within the US, the e-extension model has changed where it used to be more um, providing funding support for the individual COPs. It's moved to a, a professional development network. So the COPs have had to learn how to survive on their own which is part of why we went to being entrepreneurial in our approach to survival, um, that we had to figure out revenue generation for us to be able to do what we want to do, which is, you know, face-to-face -face meetings and be able to, you know, pay for some of these software or um, different programs that we need to produce the work. Um, so also we know our members' budgets have shrunk. So where we're able to, you know, yield some dividends on entrepreneurial projects, we can help offset costs for people that have produced more, so to speak, so a little bit of cost sharing uh, there. Um, and the grant, grant funding is tough. You know, again, Colleen spoke to in the horse industry, it is, it is tough um, because it's a pretty splintered up group. There's just not a lot of funding on the pure educational side that's out there. Um, we want to make sure our individuals know there's value to participate. So, um, and it probably depends on institution to institution what your administrator thinks or values for this. I'm fortunate my particular uh, administrator really values the extension, so I get to be in the sweet spot. Um, different states uh, may not, and so they may want to see more what's your local programming, what are you doing for me versus this bigger group. So that may, you know, person to person, that may differ a little bit. Um, and certainly as people move through career paths, um, sometimes their appointments change and they are not able to participate as much as they used to. That's happened actually quite a bit to a few of our members um, through no desire of their own if their appointment changes and they're not able to participate as fully um, with so um, that's just a reality that we have to face and why recruitment and new members, I think, is uh, pretty key. Um, I know, Gavin, we spoke about this a little bit, um, evaluating our impact, which is something I will confess that we probably need to do a better job of, but something we've mentioned and is now, you know, as we go forward is more in the thought process. So I think thinking about these projects we take on and thinking about evaluation at the same time helps us develop a plan before we do it. Um, but as uh, I think, I forget whether Kathy or Colleen alluded to that, we make sure that whatever those products actually do get presented at national meetings. So abstracts are presented, um, we get that data of the results of these programs in front of people as well um, to, to demonstrate, yes, we are evaluating programs and that's obviously always important for administration um, and making sure again that we get that information out there, the successes of the group. Um, challenges for us, especially in the um, horse industry that our COP faces, uh, more and more we see, well, I guess it's probably everybody's industry, that the education space is also being taken up or participated in with um, private for-profit companies. Um, and everybody can put information out there. So what used to be, you know, the trusted source, the university source of material, now there's so much. It's a very, very crowded space to be in. Um, and so we have a lot of uh, competition to be able to provide that information to our uh, horse owners. Um, but we think there's always this, uh, 
we can rise to the challenge, right? So we have a dedicated group of people that are that are part of this that want to put forth uh, great quality products. Um, the industry, at least again within our industry and probably in others, has recognized that they do have a need for education, um, and that's very important to their members. Um, and so people are receiving information differently. Um, and we're, again, we're still a trusted source because we're not trying to sell anybody anything. We're still trying to provide uh, the unbiased research-based information. Um, and we're not, it's not a commercial. It is strictly, here's information that we're trying to um, bring to our stakeholders. Um, so some of the unique things I think for us that's happening right now within the horse industry that uh, is a benefit of being a COP um, is they're increasingly seeing a need to be in the education sphere, um, but they don't want to be the people educating. So they're starting to reach out to um, entities that can provide that. So for us in the US, two of our big horse industry or groups are AQHA and APHA. So we are in um, conversations in works uh, to actually partner with these groups to produce educational material for their groups. Um, and so our benefit is we can say, you know what, we've been providing education for a long time. We're trusted. Many of the industry people know Extension quite well, um, probably because they've grown up through 4-H and horse shows and things like that and have that remembrance of an Extension educator in their life. Um, and so they, they feel, uh, justly so, that we are a trusted source. And so that has been... A, Hopefully, as we go forward, that's going to come to fruition and we'll be very well leveraged to participate in that broader educational sphere, reaching their marketing capability, which honestly is bigger than ours. So that's uh, where industry partnerships are going to be um, pretty key. So that's uh, part of our group at our last meeting, and I guess that's the end of what we have to share. Um, but we'll go back and look at the questions um, that you guys may have uh, put in the chat box. And um, let's see, let me see. Uh, where's the chat box? I should be able to find that. Answer any questions that you guys have. Looks like there's 25 chats. So I don't know if everybody's been answering along the way. Um, but yeah, if anybody has questions, we'll fire away. Um, you guys can unmute and we can chat. Yeah, so anyone on mute, um, so just on the bottom left hand corner, you'll see the microphone button, um, just unmute. Um, so Chris, I'll kick off. So uh, with your, like, because your extension is very still university based, um, probably thankfully for you guys, the land grant university system, but do you have engagement in your membership um, outside into other industries, which is a challenge here in Australia. Uh, we typically in our communities of practice need to engage beyond uh, you know, one organizational structure. Um, for us, no. So the engagement as far as being a member of the COP and, and being active and a contributor, mostly, I would say mostly it is um, land grant people, either county or state level specialists, although we do have a few that are private industry, but they're, they've come up through the ranks, so to speak. So there was already that connection and past experiences with, the, with teaching and academia. Um, so a few that are industry, straight industry, but most yes is still land grant based. And I think the audience is the general population, um, but the people that are producing the information is all academia. And I think even the people that are industry people that are engaged in the COP were usually the graduate students of some of the active members of the COP, so they might have been exposed to it um, during their graduate work and then enjoyed it enough that when they went in, especially if they went into the related area, um, continue to uh, be engaged. We have had a few industry folks that have um, kind of reached out to us and we really have tried to be very careful of keeping that research-based, non-biased, you know, kind of tag with whatever we put out there. And so we've, we really have not, um, you know, just been a, a, a spot where any kind of 
commodity group can put their stuff. So we've been pretty careful to um, kind of screen what we use. And most of it is we kind of think, you know, some things and, and we reach out to different, different, um, you know, individuals or folks or whatever, when we need something, would you, would you two agree with that? I yeah, think. we're sensitive to that. And, and maybe that's just more the US policy versus Australia. We just don't, we don't ever want to be like, okay, we promote neutrina mm -hmm. versus arena. So being very careful about it is not about a product or a company. It is just information. Yeah, that's the case here as well. Um, but just the information sources are pretty diverse in some cases for some COP. Um, other people that might have questions? either in the chat box or unmute. Um, you know, and I think when you talk about, I think to what you're mentioning there, Gavin, <laughs> look at some of the things we've done that are specialized at a certain target. Um, I think we've still tended to go to universities, but not necessarily land grants. So like with the EHV one again, when, you know, we go out and try to find the best researcher or the most knowledgeable person on a topic. Um, a lot of times, because it was research-based, they would be associated with a university, especially on the health-related things, but it might not be a land grant. It might have been, you know, whatever those other universities are. And for non-horse people, um, it's pretty timely. So as Kathy said before, equine influenza, so HA1, as she was speaking about, uh, stop the whole uh, movement of horses in Australia, shut down mm -hmm. entire industries. And um, there are 60,000 people employed in those industries, so it had a huge effect, but probably nothing like we're about to experience. Um, but yeah, questions from that floor. Um, thanks, Gavin. It's Penny Shaw here. I just, a uh, question I've just been, while you guys have been talking, um, scanning through your um, pages and having a look. Um, have I got it right that uh, a lot of your written, I guess, information or a lot of information is contained within uh, training courses rather than, and then you've got YouTubes and um, that sort of thing. It doesn't seem to be a lot written in what we would call, um, I guess, a normal web, web sense, or well, am I just looking at it wrong? It's a, uh, no, you're catching us in transition. So, <laughs> uh, so this isn't maybe the best time to demonstrate the website, which is why we're like, oh, let's not do that. So eExtension, everything was hosted through eExtension. And then when that model started to change, that's when we became incorporated and we created our own website. Um, and so then we were moving everything to that website that you can see. But in the meantime, now eExtension has given all of the COPs free WordPress. So now we're going backwards and we're moving everything from what a Weebly site was back into um, the WordPress site. And that's not live yet. We haven't pushed that back live. So we're unfortunately right now moving content. Uh, so it, there is a lot of written content, um, but it's, yeah. That's just reality. <laughs> so it's moving around right now. No that's worries. Really Thanks, kind of what we started with was all of our old, um, it was very laborious when we started because we were trying to um, combine, we all, like many of us had different fact sheets on, say the estrous cycle of a mare. So we were trying to combine a lot of those things. So it'd be like, okay, this is one, one piece on this topic, you know, that all these different folks contract, contract, collaborated on. And so, um, that's what Chris is saying. You can't really see right now, but um, yeah, there's, and that's really kind of when we started building content together. Um, Actually, if you want to share my, if you want to let me share the screen, I can show them what it will look like. All okay. right, sure. Grab it. If you guys want to see what it's going to look like. And then, oh, I got to figure out how I. Yeah, so we, yeah, as she looks, we have a lot of traditional written articles, but um, they're just, everything is moving around right now. So do you all see a website now? That has a, yep. 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 so yeah, so like when you were asking about some of the written content, here's, it, here's where it's going to be on this new site, you know, tons and tons of just 
pictures, scroll through. I mean, that one's just on what kind of breeds there are. You know, business resources, diseases, all these different categories. I think this is what you're talking about when you said kind of more of a traditional website look. Is that right, Penny? And then it's also going to include where you can go um, to our podcasts. So you'll be able to go to one place and, and listen to um, any of the podcasts. You'll be able to go and, what's the word? Subscribe. Sorry. Mm. I feel about podcasts, about how, um, I don't feel about podcasts, how Chris feels about infographics, but she's definitely the infographic queen. Yeah, no, that's more what I was expecting. And then when I didn't see it, I thought, oh, gosh, you guys have got a really different model where you need people to subscribe and pay and, and all that. No. Sort of stuff. So the paid, we do have, it's a mix of free resources and paid. Um, so the paid ones are those uh, packaged lessons where there's tests and quizzes and things like that and a bigger chunk of material. Um, so that we do make people pay for. Uh, but there still is plenty of, of free information um, and it's just a balance. And so we've talked about that even in our last face-to-face -face meeting, um, what is going to be a fee-based course versus free. Uh, and essentially these bigger, large projects that have had a lot of input, those are hidden behind a fee-based and then the smaller, you know, a little thing on laminitis you can get for free. And that's where you'd look under here because and uh, most of those two that are fee based, you can get a certificate or a digital badge um, if you increase or if you participate. And that's another because somebody asked on the chat, what are some of the things you've tried that haven't quite worked out? Well, the digital badges, we worked really hard on figuring out how to do digital badges. And then people just weren't that into it. They're just as happy with their certificate that they can print out on a piece of paper and do whatever they want with it. That the, I don't know if any of you guys, have you all worked with digital badges very much and had any, tried them? I mean, I don't even know if they're a thing anymore, are they? Well, Colleen, it's really interesting because um, in the college, okay, um, they're looking to start badging, doing, doing exactly what we were doing. And so it's, it's kind of interesting how our administration is, somehow decided that we need to badge, just start start the badging thing. And I'm like, I've been there. <laughs> you said, oh, we've tried that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we're just doing the, the final reviews on this website before we redirect. We just want to make sure everything is, um, I mean, if we were doing this a month from now, you know, this is what you would have come to, um, I think, when when you put in the, the website instead of the old one. And as we've, the... we've learned things and technology has changed, so we have the, the some of the learning lessons that we developed at the very beginning. Um, well, we have a new a new software, a new thing, and so we're in the middle of migrating that content to something that it just looks nicer, crisper, newer, or contemporary. Sharper. Yeah, and so um, you know that's so before we relaunch them, we want them to have this new look and feel, so they look the actual content isn't different, but they just look brand new and up to date. The, the problem when you made something, when we make something in this space 15 years ago, it's not that the content is changed, but the things we started like, what a new and prospective horse owner should know, most of that information is not different, but what was pretty contemporary 15 years ago is like beyond antiquated now. And so we're, we're trying to get some of that. And then like Kathy said, relaunch it, like it, and people will think it's fresh and new. Mm -hmm. We have a question there about the time commitments, so if you see in the chat box. <clears throat> and none of you are full-time, I might say, yeah. Just what, on the ASA expert? Or just our time commitment to this group? Yeah, just the time commitment to the group, yeah. Um, you know, probably if you're, the leadership <laughs> ones are, are a little bit more time commitment just because you have to. Uh, but when I was a casual member, it wasn't... <laughs> It wasn't that bad. And again, the time commitment, we try to be mindful of that. So like if we need infographics produced, then you do one. So we reach out to a person to do one infographic, not to say you're, you're going to have to do all of them. So that is, I think, a, a key piece. And if you, as Colleen said, since they're co-branded, well, if I manage to produce an infographic, um, 
I would put OSU and extension horses on it because we've worked together on this, but then I can send it out to my, my people. So then that it's part of my mission. So everything, at least for those of us that are, you know, the hundred percent in the equine education field, it's all a hundred percent towards what we're supposed to be doing. Um, it just might come out in a little bit different avenue. Yeah, I think a lot of us try to, to get involved with projects that we can multi-use, okay? Mm -hmm. Because I have a 50% teaching appointment and they're all equine classes. And so there's a lot of things that I've either produced for my class that I use over here, or I, I've produced for some of our e extension stuff or extension horses stuff, and I use back in, in the class. Like when we, I was doing my section of Hippology Academy, I got really behind. Well, I was fortunate because I already had some of it, like some of it put together that I used for a class that I had. And so that's where I think that if, if you can cross some stuff over or there was something new that I wanted to use over here. So this helped me get it developed and then I could use it in the other space that I had a desire for or a need for. So. Well, and I think that's too where the sharing mm -hmm. comes into is everybody's pretty open about sharing stuff. So like, Chris, for an extension program she's doing, has worked on taking some of the old body condition scoring material from eExtension, and she's updated it and made it more contemporary and used some more interactive software and made it available to everybody. Well, I'm gonna use that in another extension program that we're gonna do um, here in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of, so now I don't have to take time to build another body condition scoring module because Chris did it right and so I think we I think that's sharing that's the key yeah and so when I'm in a bind then and I'm like Colleen I didn't get this done and then she like so it, it is I think that's the value of the group when one of us is in a bind to get something we our collective experience we've got something that's able to help each other out and but you know that's that also that trust piece like just not having the lurkers that steal everything and don't contribute so I think that's the personal accountability that we have to be like, you do this. <laughs> so. yeah. and, and there's a, also a question here about the ask an expert. Um, you know, that has really become less and less of a piece. And I think part of it, when it was first started, so Kathy referred to the fact that kind of pre-e-extension and pre-horse quest, there was this group, the Southern Region Specialists, which is basically the horse extension specialist from the southeast corner of the U.S. already had a group that was going, and actually one of the first things they had done was develop an ask an expert um, thing, where basically everybody contributed questions um, that they got asked all the time. They put them into a data, a searchable database, so people could start searching the questions. Well, within a year or two, 96, I, and I don't know why this number still sticks in my head, 96% of the questions had already been asked. So you might get a question every once in a while. And I would say in the last five years, you know, I might get, I'm not even sure I get one question a year anymore. Um, and the ask an expert is still there, but I think over time, so much has become um, populated in those databases that a lot of the answers are in there, and, and I do think that eExtension US is um, investing less money in the software and stuff, because I know we went through multiple renditions of software, so I don't think it's, it's quite as upfront for people as it used to be. Mm -hmm. And it, with the Google era, you can just type it in the search bar and get- Just something. ask an expert. Yeah, they're all- Everybody's experts. an expert. <laughs> Welcome to our world, but you're all in the same world, so it's okay. <laughs> um, I'm just watching the time, so it's 10 o'clock, so, um, but any other key questions? And the beauty of this is, oh, sorry, it's uh, my coronavirus uh, phone okay. going off. <laughs> um, any other key questions before we finish up? And we're making this a two-way street, so. Uh, you know, with our college, colleagues in, a, in America, we do touch base. And so we'll stay in contact with um, Chris and Kathy and Colleen because it is, we all learn together. So this might be our only chance for interaction, but um, any questions? Well, if I can ask a question, I think when one of our conversations, um, Gavin mentioned some of the targeted 
the way you do targeted social media and do you do that as a group or how do you kind of how do you all use social media to try to um get your message out and, and drive your clientele to your content who would like to answer that one <clears throat> uh Who's still oh, here? A so, whole separate chat on that. It could be possible because we actually have one person as we talk about too that we have people that she just loves Facebook. If she could live on Facebook, she would, and she's our social media guru and she's not here. She understands how Facebook analytics works, all that stuff. Um, Sarah, are you still there? Sarah Wallace, perhaps? Um, yeah, you, sure. So, so um, our Young Farmer Business Network we just have a Facebook group and we share our art like at this stage where we just sort of have our articles that we've written and we post them into the group and, and just sort of share it that way. So it's, it's pretty simple. And so does it go to a website or is the Facebook group the primary place to go for stuff? Um, so it links from our um, extension Oz page okay yeah to facebook so and it's shared facebook. so then they'd come back to extension okay. odds to yep. to read the full article mm -hmm. um i guess does anyone else from our <laughs> group have any other comments cal um, would probably be um better placed but, um, but kathy i suppose one thing we've tried to do is the website sort of oh. if, if we are the repository in some way so that's the, the point of truth and then say the YouTubes, the, um, the podcast or um, the Facebook Live, like you guys are experimenting with, um, tends to push people back towards the website, which then is the hub that pushes out to the other information. So at the moment, we still use, you know, this sweet approach in the platform sense is based around have the point of truth being the website, and that can then push out to the other databases or other industry websites or whatever. And I see somebody here says you use LinkedIn also. Yes, that's uh, uh, that's probably Nikki. So Nikki, do you want to um, uh, discuss that one? We've not really ventured into using LinkedIn at all. Can, Can you me? unmute Nikki or you, um, you don't have audio there? If others need to jump off, please obviously feel free to do so, but uh, we can keep chatting for a while for those that are keen. Um, um, I say Nikki probably may not have audio where she is. She isn't, yeah. Or or Chris, you should be able to go in and find Nikki and unmute her. I think she's NN, NM39. Since you opened it, you, sh you might be able to unmute her. Uh, Hi, yeah. I don't think she's muted. I hear she is, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry. I've just, I had, I'm sitting at home because I've got sick um, people around me. I'm um, not Corona sick, but just sick. Um, and um, I had it headphones in and then I realized that everyone in the house could hear it. I don't know. So I don't know what's going on. Um, yeah. So we use LinkedIn, but we have a business. Ours is quite different because we have a business network. So all our our community of practice is all um, consultants that supply services to the food sector to food and five or many food small business people and so we find they are more likely to be on LinkedIn than we are on Facebook but for our community of interest which is about 1500 we have we use Facebook but for our community of practice we tend to use LinkedIn okay. but ours tends to be very event oriented so it's very much about how we write the posts to make it engaging so that it comes out as and it goes to everybody that's in the network or anyone that's on that's connected to us on linkedin but it's very much about if there's an event that we've just held like a conference or some sort of workshop we make it about that and we have to incorporate pictures of people like i did a bit of social media training and ours is very yours is beautiful and it's about horses and i know my horsey friends would absolutely love it but for us it has to be about connecting people so we're all about and i know you said you're all about relationships as well but ours is about sort of content that relates to 
or through people. That seems to be the way we get the most engagement. But I think it's very different for us because we're in government. We're not, like I'm not a technical specialist in food innovation, which is my space. I'm, you know, I'm a government employee and I don't have like the resource. There's just me, that's it. There's, I don't have the resources of say the university or, or the, the sort of the land grant system that you guys have got. So we're, it's sort of, um, ours is more like a business network, which is why we use LinkedIn. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I would say though, you know, when you think about resources, it's not like they give us anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have this computer and I bought this microphone, but the rest of it honestly is, it's our time. Our time and shared experiences are the resources. So there's not a lot. That, yeah, there's no financial or extra. <laughs> Well, that's, well, then that's, we're in a very similar spot though, except that you are technical experts. That's how I, I see from what I've heard, you know, that's, and you were saying, Chris, about, um, you know, you feel like your space is being eroded by everyone's now an expert. Yeah. Um, so we, we use the Ask an Expert function a lot because we get lots of questions around, oh, things like, you know, um, how to stop bacteria growing in um, apple cider vinegar or what can I do with my Chinese date products or I want to produce, um, I want to make a product out of breast milk or, you know, really quite bizarre things. But um, so we use Ask an Expert quite a lot because then we send it out to our network who are actually technical experts and we get quite a good response and then we provide funding on a sort of rotational basis for businesses to work with um, some of these experts. And I, I think without the funding, we would have a lot less engagement than we, you know, we do. So that's probably, you know, that's like a grant between 10,000 Australian dollars and 50,000 Australian dollars. So that, that works quite well for us. Oh yeah. That's motivating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I, I'd say our primary motivation is just the promise that we will pay it back. Um, we're going to try to provide you recognition and we're going to try to help with the promotion and professional development and you'll get something back. We don't have a very. Right. Yeah. So, so your community of practice is really other experts, aren't they in the yes. equine space? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Get and there's it. just not that many of us that exist in the world. So I think you got also that peer pressure, like who else are you going to talk to? <laughs> so, <laughs> But you're obviously a really engaging and sociable group though. Like I think that's, whereas it's, I feel like, or maybe I shouldn't feel like this, but I feel like like most of our community practice are middle-aged white males. So I don't know. <laughs> we only have one of those in our COP. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> yeah, <they're... laughs> Ours are mostly middle-aged white women. <laughs> I know I relate really well to that, but not so much. To well, that. but you know what? I, I think there's a kernel of truth to that because we are shared socially. Like we are a group that connects because it is, we're all yeah. female horse owners. So it yeah. is much easier for us to develop social connection. Right. Yeah. I, I, I have already have all group. retired. We have a few in men a male in dominated retired. world. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Gavin. <laughs> Shouldn't have started that one. <laughs> That's okay. Would you like me to leave now? And you can. Just <laughs> <laughs> fine. <laughs> but don't forget Craig Woods, though. So he still has. Uh, he's our one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, but a, a little our mo model and funding and motivation has evolved over the years because initially there were funds coming from E Extension that. Um, you know, I used to get some funds and so that helped me engage because I'd get a certain amount of money, I'd hire a student worker that would help me build the content, you know, and I don't know that Chris was around while we were getting some of those. One time we could apply for it, it was a, it was a pretty good um, yeah. pool of money and then that helped us kind of, you get some money, then you feel responsible to go ahead and build, that's how we built the app and some different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And then we went through an evolution, so that kind of, the, that was drying up and so then we went to doing the grant thing and then we haven't been very successful to grants and so then we went a different route and so um it's kind of how to keep engaged and everything has really evolved because our funding sources have evolved and thankfully we came up with this brainstorm last year of the hypology academy and that's really been 
a helpful um, kind of rejuvenated us to, to enable us to do some things it's financially. Yeah. yeah, financially. And so um, there was a time that folks could come to the meetings, the initial ones. And we even covered, um, I think what some of the first ones even covered the flights. The and then, then that has really um, whittled away. And this year, because of our success with Apology Academy, we were able to cover a little bit more than what we did the previous year which helps because then if you can cover some folks to come to the meeting, then that is able to entice some more of them to be able to come because it's, it's more affordable for them. Some of them just can't, just don't have the funds to do some of those kinds of things. And so, um, yeah, it's a constant evolution, I'd say. Well, and even in terms of when you were asking about the hours or how much, we try to get a lot of product done at that meeting. So that, I mean, there's a lot of work time. So like infographics, for you know the next four months, or a bunch of podcasts recorded mm -hmm. when everybody's in one place, to get as much out of that time together in terms of product um, as we can, and it may be disseminated out then throughout the year. But uh, the annual meeting is usually two full days and a half day. The leadership commit team comes in a little early to finalize the agenda and stuff like that. And then it's two full days and a half day. In January. In January. When Louisville, Kentucky is lovely. So yeah, the hotel's cheaper because nobody wants to be there. Yeah. Just, uh, one quick question to uh, uh, and point, I suppose, as I observe. But we'd be happy to come to Australia and do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be arranged. Um, but uh, just watching you all work, because you're right across America, um, is this true, uh, just validate this for me, in, I just see that your relationships are richer and more productive because you do have a formalised way of engaging, like you do meet monthly, you have the annual catch up, so it's not just the fact that you're all passionate about horses, but you have a way of operating a community practice yeah. that has made your relationships a lot richer, is that correct? Mm -hmm. I think we're really a community actually, I mean I think it's really a community. And yeah. you're meeting people that you wouldn't have met without it. Correct. You're exactly right. Mm -hmm. And they, they become, you know, and again, maybe it's because the type of community practice we're in, we become friends and colleagues and like we share professional ups and downs. So mm -hmm. for, for me, this community practice is way more than just this is my work thing. Like it's also, yeah, very, very valued colleagues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gavin, I'm just wondering and now might not be you know with time ticking by but yeah i'm really interested to find out a little bit more about e-learning and in light of the coronavirus and travel bans and you know people needing to work more you know in in isolation um yeah like i think this Social is distancing. real yeah this is really where it's going to be at for a while so just yeah what are some of the opportunities and how can we yeah really, really ramp, ramp up, up from here well, I'll tell you one thing. They, all of my classes for the remainder of the semester have to be online, so I'm going to go and grab some of our content that we have and utilize it in some of my classes and some of those types of things because I know it's there. I mean, I know what it is, and so rather than recreating it all, um, that's, you know, j just knowing what we have and able to, to um, put it out there. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I would say the group members here are at an advantage because there's such a, a, a you know, content big database of all of this online material that we've all created that they're in a way better spot than some of the other colleagues right now um yeah. something else i mean and it, it the coronavirus has put us in one spot last year my state had horrific flooding and mm -hmm. i remember sending stuff out to um the our our group just for resources and stuff about how to deal with horses and disaster, redoing pastures, blah, blah, blah. And so I got a ton of things back, website of extension of the horse type, because I knew who to reach out to. They all responded and helped me build this resource spot for a horse community of stuff that I didn't have to all of a sudden create because I kind of knew who to go to and call to. So, you know, um, so to me, you know, some of people, if people are hunting resources for that particular thing related to the coronavirus or different kinds of things you know it gives you a spot to reach out to different groups to say you know give me stuff and how can i populate a thing without having to sit there and recreate it all so 
Mm -hmm. So Gavin, the question on the mechanics of the e-learning process, I don't know what exactly you mean on the mechanics. Are you, are you using other tools other than the traditional um, e-extension type tools? Like you have, you know, your YouTubes, et cetera, podcasts, et cetera. So do you use a suite approach to provide the e-learning in and it's a format like, or is there other, other tools you're using? Yeah, like the different, the learning platform. So originally everything was in Moodle and then there's been quite a few mm. courses they did in SoftChalk. And then the ones we've been playing in right now are the storyline from Articulate. And yeah. um, so I've been having a ball uh, learning how to do that because they're super interactive. And that's, I think, yeah. honestly, for our distance learner um, that isn't having face-to-face, -face, having an interactive online experience, even if it's interacting themselves and, and doing learning through manipulation, I think is probably going to, again, give us a little bit of a heads up <laughs> on this journey uh, because we've already been playing in that space. So what you really need, I think the first step is to figure out what do you want, how much do you want to track? Because like we use lots of different softwares. But if we want to track the students, give them certificates, that sort of thing, we use Moodle, which eExtension provides, and everything goes into Moodle. Kind of an LMS. Which is, yeah. the, which is the learning management system. So, and yeah, so, so if, we've just developed a Agriculture Victoria. I was involved in establishing a learning management system for us because yeah. we had an internal one, but nothing for, you know, farmers or young farmers. Mm -hmm. So... We, this is like a really great conversation uh, for us right now. And we have been using um, a different, not Moodle, but a different um, platform to host it. But we have been using Articulate um, to develop up our e -learning. Oh, yay. Yeah. So in my, <laughs> like, we're, like storyline. Yeah, yeah, I'm building in storyline too. And so what we're using to go external, so our, on campus, we're Canvas. But there's um, something yeah. that's in structure canvas, which is an okay. external facing piece of canvas and not just for um, students. So that's where that will end up being placed. Now, I don't know the details of how something is in structure based versus canvas based. Um, I just know how to put storyline in there and make it work. <laughs> so, yeah. I need to find that out because they keep telling us <laughs> we're going to get to use that and for our extension things and it hasn't surfaced yet. So right. I'm going to tell them. Oklahoma State's got it, you guys. Yeah. yeah. See, this yeah. is where we get stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, how we work. I think this is where we've too <laughs> gone to a lot of this modular approach and looking at software that we can do modules. Then Chris can put it in Canvas structure. She can put the upload the same SCORM module. In yeah. Canvas. She can upload the same module. She can give it to Kathy. She can give it to me. You know, it's back to that idea of build it once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, you know, you know, you can, as you know, because you work with Storyline Articulate too, you can publish it to the web and just you don't even need an LMS. You can't track anything, but you can make the content available without even using an LMS if you want to. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. give us any data, and we all need data, right, to say this is yeah, learning, this is what they're learning and and all of that stuff. Yeah, and that's been the challenge for us. So, you know, ideally, our barrier has been getting people to register for the mm -hmm. e-learn. So, you know, ideally, they just Google, then they click in and bang, there they are. But, yeah, this registration bit seems to be um, a little bit of a, a barrier for us. Yeah, they don't like it. Yeah, and I think we've dealt with that too. And there have been a couple places in campus that mm -hmm. I think create a couple, like the whole assigning seats thing. Like if somebody buys, a, a, um, signs up for a course for somebody else, somebody's extension office might pay for a course for their volunteer. And there's a step there that seems to create, when she say, Kathy, a fair bit of confusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We usually, every time we do hip hop, we get a handful of I'm trying to get access to it and it says I can't and usually that's the step that mm -hmm. and of course we mm -hmm. have no idea how many people say it's too many steps to register we're not going to bother. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. If they get past three clicks and they're like I'm not clicking anymore. 